Welcome to another episode of Woman Witness Podcast, The Stories at the Well. Here on this platform, we bring to you voices of women who are out there making a positive difference in their lives, in their families, and the community around them. Today, I have a very special guest, and we're going to be talking about a very important topic. So lean in. You are going to enjoy today's episode. I'm going to go ahead and introduce my guest, but first, I'm going to read a little bit about her. I want you guys to meet Dre Lenore. She's a mother of three who wears many hats. She is not only a creative force behind the glass houses of paper mache lives, but also an author of a devotional journal undressing. What sets Drea apart is her passion for championing the broken beautifully movement a community of women who have faced challenges and are determined to emerge stronger. Using her own life experiences, Drea is dedicated to advocating for others through storytelling. She believes that by sharing her own trials and triumphs, she can inspire others to overcome their own obstacles and find success. Drea's ultimate mission is fostering the meaningful connections and encourage new thoughts and conversations around storytelling. Her goal is to demonstrate the power of God's grace in her life and others around them to seek the same grace and mercy for themselves. So without further ado, I want to introduce to you my very special guest, Drea Lenore. Hey, Drea, welcome to the well. Hey, thank you, Leah. Thank you so much for being here and being my special guest on today's episode. Mm -hmm. So today you reached out to us and you said that you wanted to talk to us about some very important topics. So today I want to go ahead and just dive right in by just asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself. I know I just read a little bit, mm -hmm. but tell us who you are. Who am I really? <laughs> at, the, at the crux of it, you, you gave a lot, but at the crux of it, really, I'm a woman who loves God with a, a love that I can't describe unless you want me to spend the next hour crying. He moves me every day. I love. I, I can't even express it. But um, I'm also a mom. I have two sons on my own, and I have a, a daughter from another mother and father. I'm very diverse. I'm a trusted friend. I'm yeah. loyal to probably a fault. Yeah. And I, I laugh a lot. That's what I'm known for. I have like a, they call it scandalous laugh, but. <laughs> uh, <laughs> laughter's good for the soul. <laughs> but I'm just really trying to do the most with what God has given me yes. in this lifetime. And yeah. I've, I've stumbled along the way, but God is good. Yeah. And I think that's what it's all about too, Drea. You said it, when you reached out to us, you said that you find power through storytelling and there is nothing more powerful than your own story and your own mm -hmm. testimony. Mm -hmm. So you definitely found a good route to get out there and do exactly what God has placed in your heart. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you mentioned that you wanted to talk about is the importance of a father's love. And I love mm -hmm. that so, so much. And I think it's extremely important to have the love of a father. And I want you to start off by just telling us and explaining to some of our listeners your thoughts around the, is the essentials for a woman to have that nourishing father-daughter relationship, particularly in the overall development of our, our lives. Yeah. And well-being. I'm not going to give you a textbook response. I, I'm not a psychologist or none of that. I'm going to give you a response just from what I've experienced. At the end of the day, even biblically speaking, we know men are supposed to be the, the leaders of our, our households yeah. and whatnot. But as a small child, I recognized very early that I had expectations of my father without anyone teaching me that. It was just something very, I guess, inherent in me. I looked to him for love and protection and all those things. But unfortunately, I was not necessarily the recipient of that. It didn't 
stop me from always looking for those things from him. But what he, I learned from him are the ways that, I guess essentially how I should expect men going forward to treat me through his inability to show love in a healthy way. In fact, I, I, I risk saying, I'm not sure if my dad knew how to love. Mm. And with that being said, like I, I learned very early not to ask men for things because I was, I remember what it was like asking him for something. I, my anxiety level would go out the roof anytime I felt that I had to ask him for something because the response was never a great one. It was a very harsh response. And mm. I, I can see how that has kind of played itself out over my life because I struggled like to ask people for things worse, a man for something mm. because I just was taught perhaps not through his behavior. Right. He was very harsh with his words. I don't remember too often too many I love yous or or mm -hmm. anything like expressing like that I was a, a beautiful person or you know, oh you look you look pretty. Like those types of positive reinforcements were not there. Yeah. And those are the things that kind of set the foundation yeah. that mm -hmm. we learn early on as young girls. Mm-hmm. So you think to yourself, well, I thought to myself, I don't want to put words in anyone else's mouth, but <laughs> you're, if your father is treating you that way, who, who would treat you better than how your father treats you? Yeah. That's your dad. Yeah. So I, I, I unfortunately walked through many years of my life with a very unhealthy expectation of, of relationships, especially with, with men. Yeah. And I can also say, too, it's not just for us females to have, you know, to be daddy's little girl and all that stuff. But it's also for, for males as well. There's very yeah. important things. I have sons. So there's very important things that they need to learn from yeah. their father that I cannot teach them, that I cannot replace. Right. And when they do not have that, it's also detrimental to, to male children as well. I, that, I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't mm -hmm. agree more. I have... Two little, two older ones, mm -hmm. and then I have three small, younger ones, all boys. I couldn't agree more, and mm -hmm. I do believe that that foundation does help both girls and young girls and young boys um, with that relationship with the father. Now, mm -hmm. I want to ask you a little bit more, and thank you so much for sharing that insight. I want to ask you a little bit more to to uh, elaborate on the long term effect of the father's love for women in their mental and emotional well-being so what happened with me unfortunately was that mm -hmm. as i was dating even in my like young adulthood coming up to my last marriage i i didn't look for the right things because again i was always looking at myself through a mirror of my father's eyes mm -hmm. so even my my children's father that relationship was not very good and in fact it was went on much longer than it should have because i was receiving and and also responding in very toxic ways um, because that's what I saw. That's what I also saw between my, my mother and father. I didn't see healthy love. I knew very early out because I didn't have the greatest family life that I wanted to be a mom, like as soon as possible. Yeah. I wanted my own family. I wanted the, the ability to express love in my own way. And I, I was going to be a great mom and all these things. Yeah. So I, I actually did end up having my first son pretty, pretty young. Now my selection process is a little bit strange. <laughs> because I ultimately ended up f being with somebody and having children with someone who was very similar to my father to in a lot father. of ways. And that mm. was, not good for <laughs> was not good for them. For many years I did, I, I blame myself because it, I, it was my choice at the end of the day. Yeah. But I can also say I was kind of just mimicking yeah. what I had seen yeah. and come to expect of myself for myself and so on. And yeah. that's the thing with when you see you grow up in a very unhealthy environment, you put yourself in these situations that takes you way too long to step away from because it's just what you know. As bad as it might sound, as bad as it might have felt, it's just you're kind of used to it because it's what you've experienced. It's what you've been exposed to. So in terms of selecting, you know, who I had children with, that was definitely influenced by the relationship with my father. I picked someone that I felt like my dad could say, you made a good choice, girl, like, <laughs> yeah. good for you. But that person was so much like my dad and, and in so many ways that were not 
good for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I completely, I completely understand. And I hear so much. And, and here, let me, let me just say this. I think majority of, of women, I, I don't know this to be true. So please don't come for me. Mm-hmm. Back check. But I think majority of women, I think we do mirror what we see. We do end up kind of being with someone like our father. Why? I, I don't know whether they're good, whether they're bad, whether they're strange. We end up always ending up with someone similar to our fathers, which is why I think that the way our father, we interact with our fathers or the way our father daughter relationship it is important so mm-hmm. i definitely see that to be a, a huge concern which i'm glad that you're talking about it because i don't think it gets talked about enough i want to ask you uh, lastly regarding the father daughter or father's love i want to ask you what advice would you give women who may have grown up without a father figure in their lives and are currently struggling in their own relationships that's an interesting question because i used to my relationship with my dad was so complicated, so difficult. I used to wonder if it, maybe it was better not to have had him around. Yeah. And I don't know that I have the answers to whether it's better to have no dad around or to have a not so, God bless him, but not the greatest father around. Yeah. I know this is not going to be the answer that many people want to hear, but my identity became clear to me the closer I got to God. And I know that's perhaps not the answer for everybody, but that's my answer because I got to see myself. Here I go. You see No, (laughs) no, no. You know what? This is what it's about, Drea. This is what it's about. Mm. This is what it's about. Anytime I talk about the love of the Lord, it gets me. (laughs) But that's when I got to see myself. If you're not fortunate enough to have people pouring into you, what else do you have? And that was it for me. Like mm. I, I've, I've always had a lot of friends. Yeah. Some have come and gone. But in, in terms of in my household, where that, that love and that, that positivity and that influence is supposed to come in strong, I unfortunately didn't have that. So yeah. I went a long time recognizing that, although I was not intentionally walking with God, he was walking with me. It- and he was showing me things about myself that and he was showing me eventually it took me a long time now the lies that the enemy was just pummeling me with unfortunately using people close to me using my 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 dad using my mom using my children's father using you know yeah. who came to be my husband my husband here that I'm now yeah. divorced from yeah yeah I know it sounds like a cliche I don't know kind of response but yeah. You, men and women, we're, 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 we're fallible. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we're not going to get what we need from one another. But I'm telling you, it is through the love of God that I came to see truly who I am. So that's kind of my answer. But I also would say that if you're in a relationship and it does not feel good, no matter what you are you are exposed to, no matter what you were used to if it's not feeling good you have to really stop and ask yourself the hard questions and ask yourself why you're still there because we have this one life here to live yeah. and we got to think about how we want to live it yeah you know i i want to ask you do you have did you grow up in church did you grow up with that foundation i did not interesting i did not I went to Catholic school and the God that I knew growing up, I've always had a reverence for God, but I didn't have a relationship with God. So I went to Catholic school, we went to Catholic church and God in that respect, no disrespect to anybody, it's a a very judgmental God. It's a very, Mm. you're gonna go to hell if you don't do these things. Mm. It doesn't Mm -hmm. speak of God's grace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make good use of the blood of Jesus. Because mm. it does not speak about the grace that we've been given. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I didn't grow up in church per se. Like, again, Catholic school, Catholic church. My right. understanding of God was very different, but I right. did have reverence for God. I always believed in God, had a reverence for God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can hear it. And it's and it's very interesting. I can definitely hear the foundation because you mentioned that you didn't know 
true love and you didn't know like what what it really meant to have that relationship until you found God and really begin to find him one for yourself and then really begin to nourish that relationship. And I can attest to, I can agree with that. I I under I follow you fully and, and totally understand because I do believe that once you find God or once God calls you and draws mm-hmm. you near, he will reveal himself through you. And through that, you will see yourself finally. I can go on and on, but I won't. Um, <laughs> and I could just, I hear so much of myself in you that it's its not even funny. I mean, I can tell you that my relationship, even with my own father, has never been good. And I mean, it has, it had its highs and it had its lows. So I can agree with you when you say there's really no right or wrong answer. I'm pretty sure that if I was to give my answer, especially if I gave my hurt answer, oh, yeah. I would be like, nah, baby. Uh-uh. And that's, that's, that's hurt. That's me not being able to see clear through all the pain, hurt, and trauma that I endured. But the healed answer would be the one that you gave. Once you find out and God shows you your true identity, I can see his purpose. I'm not no I'm no longer mad at him. I no longer hurt hold that hurt and that anger towards him because I realized that that was only keeping me captive. Mm-hmm. So I, I I'm glad you brought this conversation to the well because I think a lot of us and whether you had a great relationship or whether you know you had a poor one, I'm glad that you brought this this conversation because I do believe that the anger and the hurt that we experience as a child could lead and carry us and hold us captive through all to through many of our relationships moving forward. 100%. <laughs> a lot of years in that captivity. 100%. Yeah, I mean I I I'm, I'm going to tell you it wasn't until I I don't really know. I don't really know what that moment was, what that defining moment was, but the moment that I was able to forgive and let go I was free. I was free. And I'm still, you know, I and I'm not sitting here saying that I'm perfect. I'm still trying to break free of a lot of other things. I mean, when you have over all these years, I ain't gonna say no numbers. We are all digging our way out. Yes. Okay. I used to think because the again, the relationship was so painful to me. I used to think if when my dad passed and I, if I were to ask to, to if I were asked to speak at his funeral that I wouldn't even know what to say because I I cannot recall a good memory. I used to say that. And my mm. dad ultimately passed in in 20 late 2021, December of 2021. Oh, I'm sorry. And I will tell you as bad as he treated me when he was gone and I it came as a shock because he didn't really tell anybody that I think he knew he was going, but he didn't really tell us. So even in his death that was traumatizing because it just it was like this. It was sudden. But what I can tell you is that I was the, the, the child that he tried to call the most leading up to that time. Why do you think? You know, I just truly think in his own way, he was sorry. He knew his time was coming up. You know? Did you go? I No. Like he was in the U.S. And at that time, we couldn't travel because all the COVID restrictions. Yeah. And like that. But if I could, I would have dropped everything to be there, despite it all. So you're you're angry for a lot of years, and then you reach a place of peace, and then sometimes you kind of have these mo- emotions come through you. But in that moment when he was gone, like I got to hear him, the, I was the last person to hear him, and nothing else mattered. Mm. Your heart just says, "Let it go." Nothing else mattered, you know. So I say that to anybody whose dad is still here. If you have to love them from a distance, love them from a distance, but honor your mother and father. Oh, and I say that. And you know, you're not, this is not supposed to be a crime. <laughs> no, you <laughs> This Drea. is not supposed to be, you know. Drea, you, you know what? If anything, you set a lot of us free. And I think if any listener out there who is listening, who may be struggling in their own relationships with their father and their father is still breathing and they have not 
freed themselves. Listen to Dre on this and consider it. Consider it. Okay. You oh. just made me almost tear up. Okay. <laughs> Cheerio. Yeah, Dang it. Okay. Now we're going to turn our attention. <laughs> we're going to turn our attention to life choices. Mm -hmm. Could you briefly explain to us why making informed decisions is important in the context of our important life choices? I don't know if I'm answering this right, but what I will tell you, one of my biggest, and I hate the word hate, but one thing that I absolutely hate, despise, is when people lie to me mm -hmm. and when they manipulate me because it takes away my opportunity to make an informed decision. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So unfortunately, a lot of people do lie. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of people do manipulate. Yep. But I will tell you what I've learned. People lie, people manipulate because they want to sway your ability to make the right decision. But I will also tell you where this has changed for me. Yeah. Again, the closer I got to God and the more that I began to recognize how he speaks to me, that spiritual gut <laughs> or intuition or whatever thing, yeah. want to call it. Yeah. It is so key. I've ignored it many times in my life, mm -hmm. but I've learned brutal lessons as a result of it. And I will not do that. So mm -hmm. I will say to people that mm -hmm. people will lie. People will manipulate. Yeah. But oftentimes we know. I, mm -hmm. I rarely talk to a person when you ask them, were you completely you know. taken off guard there? And most of the time the answer is, well, you know what? I felt this or I saw this or I had this moment where there's always a time where that spiritual gut <laughs> is telling us something. Yeah. Can but, I ask yeah. you something, Drea? Mm -hmm. How do we as, you know, when we have that gut feeling, right? We have that gut feeling and, you know, we call it woman intuition. You know, how do we know, you know, how not to act out of maybe anger or out of sadness, or perhaps we've been hurt in the past, right? So that, you know, the little devil on our shoulders are saying, mm -hmm. oh, here we go again. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we separate that, that feeling from that feeling, that gut feeling like God's talking to you? So what I've learned from, from my own experience is God is truly not a God of confusion. So if what I'm feeling is creating confusion. I stop and I really try to settle in. I've also had to still myself. And I'll, I can, I don't know if we have enough time, but if I get to the example where I can tell you where responding too quickly can yeah. cost you a lot. Yeah. I, I've learned, I've paid the price for responding too quickly and I've learned to still myself. Yeah. Shut my mouth. Whatever it is I'm thinking to say, do, I just, I just shut it down. And I just sit there and, and, and really, and sometimes I have to pray and I have to pray multiple times to understand what is it I'm feeling? God, what are you telling me? Mm. And I've learned that he speaks to me in about three different ways. He speaks mm. to me through my feelings for sure. I, I weep a lot. I feel things very deeply. Mm. He speaks to me through a knowing because sometimes I will be like, I'll say a particular thing like, mm. don't do X, Y, Z. And the person will say, well, are you just speculating? I was like, I don't know why I know. I just know. Just don't do it. Yeah. There's a knowing and then through my dreams. And so now that I understand that, yeah. Hmm, I pay very, very close attention. So yeah. if I feel anger welling up, if I feel anything that is creating just too much confusion or too much of anything contrary to what I believe yeah. either the word God is saying or what God is saying to me, I pause and I try to understand it. Yeah, pause and figure it out. And it's not e it's not always easy. I'm no. gonna tell you that. But I I paid the price for moving too quickly. Yeah, that that's 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 some good advice, Drea, because I, I do think that a lot of us and I know for for instance, I know me, I can only you know, I love talking. I only give examples about myself, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are listening and you know, if you if if you find yourself in these situations, right? You find yourself guarded, you find yourself angry, or you find yourself um, suspicious or hesitant, right? We don't want to move in 
in a way that will not only affect us, but affect so much around us. I mean, I can tell you this happened to me on many occasions. I can tell you that was one of my biggest hurdles and I am still working at on it. I think for me, and I don't want to take up too much of your time, but for me, I have always been one to, one, I, I voice my opinion. Sometimes I voice my opinion too quickly or sometimes I hold it. So I went from one extreme to the yeah. far yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You I know, know like, wait like, a minute. And I have to find, I had to find a medium. And I'm still working on it. Sometimes it gets tilted a little bit, right? So Same. I hear what you're saying. And I couldn't agree more with the standing still part. Waiting and praying. I, I love that that advice. That was some good, good advice. Okay. So I want to ask you, when it comes to making important life choices, what advice do you have for women in this particular point? You said you already spoke about standing still mm -hmm. and praying through it. Is there any other things, perhaps if you have someone who is not quite there in their relationship with God? I'm a person that I, I truly believe when it, you write something down and you, you write out the vision and you make it plain, it really it will become. So I'm very big on journaling. Here's what I know about myself. And here's what I would love for other women not to do. Don't be me in this. <laughs> I'm a person. God has given me the gift of being able to take. If you give me this, I'm going to find something I can make out of it. I see uh. potential in mm. almost anything, the smallest of things. Yeah. But I have misapplied that gift. And using it on people. And the thing mm. is, people, when they show you who, who they, they are, are, stop trying to see something else. And it sounds horrible now, but I've paid the price for that. Mm. If a person, like, I, I, I don't want someone to see a person who, for example, and I'm, I'm using some real life examples, mm. who doesn't necessarily want more for life. Mm. doesn't necessarily have all that the same level of ambition as you have but what you see in that person is all they need is a helping hand all they need is a supportive partner and then they're off to the races yeah don't see a, a person who is very guarded and very quiet and and just say oh they're just shy Hi. like stop yeah taking something yeah that's very evident and making constructing something else Oh, I see. It's a you're... very dangerous thing that I think we women do. I know I I do that. I do. Yeah. Right. No, I hear you. And this is a thing that I really, really just don't <laughs> want people to do. <laughs> this is good, Drea. Do not this is good. Gift. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This is good. Mm. This is good. I want to tell you why it's good because I say this so often. We want to fix everything, right? In in nine times on time, just trying to say we sometimes are right majority of the time, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, especially if we see you know someone going down a road or we see you know behavior, and we said we can. I love the analogy you use as far as a napkin. You like I can fix this, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I I I couldn't agree more with you. I think that we do do that, and for me, I don't know. I'm I feel like I'm a teacher by nature, so I kind of feel that I could. I can fix that. I can yeah. teach you how to do that. <laughs> so yeah. you're saying some good advice is to not. Yeah. I think sometimes you have to truly, you know what also is key? Yeah. Stop doing things for people that they haven't asked you to do. That's it. That's it. Like support a person. Don't do things for people that they can do for themselves. Yeah. These are all lessons I've had to learn. And I had to just catch myself the other day because I almost just did it again. <laughs> And it's like, because again, that nature, like you have a heart to help people and you sometimes, sometimes you see it very clearly. Yeah. But if, if that is not your assignment, mm -hmm. you're going to pay a, a hefty price for involving yourself and trying to drag, you know, horses to water and trying to push rocks up hills. Wow. Dream. Perhaps it's just not your portion. <laughs> so, wow. So again, harsh, That's harsh life advice. Nice. Harsh lessons. Save yeah. yourself, people. <laughs> <laughs>
That's some great advice, man. I can go on and on for that. We already highlighted the importance of, you know, one, kind of taking your hands off of everything, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, focus on your assignment. I like to say that because mm -hmm. I think about um, my kids the, and I always tell them, they're like, mom, I can do it. I'm like, yeah, you can. And, and I think this is good for moms out there too. Yes, they can, but I'm still going to monitor to make sure they do it right, right? Mm -hmm. To a mm -hmm. certain, to a certain extent, especially when they're young, okay? When they're young, that's fine. You know, and I do believe that, you know, as moms, we do want to guide them. So what would you tell moms who may be struggling with taking their hands off and letting their child live a life that they can learn and, and grow from and evolve from? Okay. So... My personal example, yes. with my sons not having the father figure that I would have, I would have preferred. Yeah. I, I don't want to be disrespectful to him, but that I would have preferred. I yeah. overcompensated mm. because I did not want them to experience any gaps. Yeah. I did not want them to experience pain that I had felt. I did not want them to, to fail. I wanted to make sure that if I'm going to be their, their source, aside from God, I want to make sure I propel them in the, the right way and they can be as successful as possible. Yeah. Here's what I will tell you. Overcompensating, it unfortunately sets a very unrealistic expectation that mm. is not necessarily sustainable. Mm. I think as moms, we have to play our part. We have to be the best moms that we can. We have to plant the right seeds in them. Yeah. And if we see them going down the wrong path, we got to let them know. But sometimes some of our kids are stubborn. Yeah. And sometimes we got to take our hand off of it and let God do whatever he's going to do in the situation. And if he grants you peace when you take your hand off, you know you're good to take your hand off. Yeah. At, at the end of the day, I think... Yeah. They reach a point in their life where they can listen to you or they can choose not to. Yeah. Are you going to drive yourself crazy running behind them, trying to force them to see what you're seeing? You can't. You you literally drive yourself crazy. Yeah. So yeah. I, my main points are we cannot overcompensate. We can just be the best moms that we can be. We can't fill in gaps for dad or anyone else or any girlfriend, boyfriend who's broke their heart. We can only be the best moms that we can be. We yeah. teach them well. If we yeah. plant the right seeds, even if they depart for a moment, come back. I expect for them to come back. Yes. Yes, Drea. That is and that from my heart because that's what I'm going through right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's great advice, Drea. That is such great advice. I think a lot of moms listening, I know even for myself, I can take that and run with it. And it's good. It, I think it's good for the kids. It's good. It, sometimes God will bring them through and all we can do is just pray because we instill the right things in them. Okay. So I want to move on to a more sensitive topic that you wanted to discuss mm -hmm. and which is the sex, which is sexual assault in marriages. Mm -hmm. So let's start by beginning. Can you tell us a little bit about like your relationship and when you realize that you were experiencing this type of assault? So in that marriage, I will first start off by saying delusional was a, a big thing for me. I did mm -hmm. not pay attention to the, the spiritual gut. I did not pay attention to the several, you know, subtle signs and sometimes not so subtle mm -hmm. that the Lord was, was placing before me, allowing me to experience so I can see perhaps this is not the right partner for you. And here's kind of where, again, the dad and the choices come in. I now had gone to a completely other end of the spectrum. I went for the very mm -hmm. quiet, not the corporate individual, the very, yeah. you know, not a lot of friends and just seemingly very nice person completely separate completely very loving, yeah. ad adoring all of that yeah okay so you'd think you'd be safe there <laughs> did the person have the same level of um, ambition as i did no but i thought i could fix that i thought if i see what i see if you see what i see in you you're going to see it too and we're, we're going to be good but i also went on the you know accounts of you know his sisters who were my friends and yeah. saying what a nice person he is. So I think nice person became really important to me. The ambition we can work out, the finances we can work out. If you're a really nice person, you're, you have a good heart, 
we should be able to work things out. I was very wrong there. And I made a, a lot of assumptions. But going through that, that marriage, the, the struggle was mostly financial, a lot of lies, a lot of manipulation. There yeah. was no physical assault. There was no essay in any part of that marriage, though. It was a mm -hmm. lot of, you know, a person who doesn't have their own things going on. So they literally latch on to you and you have you feel stifled. You yeah. Feel like you no longer be your own person. Yeah. It was a lot of that. Yeah. And a lot of lies about finances and, and a lot of yes. just conflict in terms of getting on the same page on how we're going to move the family forward. Right. That's right. The, the assault part happened at the very end when the, when the relationship was actually now eroding and going down. A right. path where I think he recognized, I think she's going to leave. Mm. And it only happened. And I don't like saying only because it should never happen. Yeah. But it happened at the end. Yeah. And I think, again, it's almost like a, when maybe when a dog feels like they're backed into a corner, they start latching. And, and, right? Yeah. And yeah. I think that's ultimately what happened. It was strange because I, I started noticing a deterioration in the person's behavior. Yeah. Probably about two years prior to when it actually ended. Mm -hmm. and, and for those who understand like, like things of the spirit, I truly believe there were sp different spirits at play here because I could feel yeah. them. Oh, wow. Yeah. But, yeah. But yeah. nonetheless, with that assault, I, he, he actually assaulted me twice in, in less than 24 hours. Mm -hmm. One was a physical assault, which I was, mm -hmm. I was really not happy about. I, I didn't call police. You did it. I did not. My thought was, okay. Mm -hmm. And maybe, again, it goes back to the fact that no, I did this so often. Mm. But we didn't exclude. This is not the couple that we were. So it's not like it was a normal thing. But I right. was willing to just excuse it if he would just get out the house. Kind of right. Thing. But it, it elevated from there mm -hmm. uh, um, or escalated from there because then very early in the morning, that's when... The, the essay took place. Mm. And I tell you what, again, in that moment, I don't even know where my brain was. And I think when, mm. I think it was confusing. Yeah. Because like, you're like, first of all, you're like, what is going on here? Really? Right. And then you have children in the home. So you don't want to start like going carrying through. on because I promise you, if I had uttered any type of yell because my older son was already on high alert from the first incident because I called him and asked him to come home. I didn't tell him why, mm. but he knew me telling him to come home was serious. There was a problem. So he was right. already on high alert. So if I had uttered any sound, he would have for sure come in and I know he would have gotten hurt. Yeah. So you have all these different things kind of going through your head. And in the right. movies, you're watching somebody else. You're like, oh, do this. Do it. it. Yeah. You have all these responses to it, but I promise you, it's not necessarily like that. You, sh I shut down and I'm, a, I'm, a little bit of a fighter and I shut down. Mm. But nonetheless, uh, the next day, I, I just need to get out of the house because when he came home from work, I did not want to be there. No. So yeah. I went to a friend's home and as soon as I walked that e the, the evening after and I went to my friend's home and I, I, I don't even know what she asked me. I think she said like, oh, how's it going? How's your day or whatever? And I just, bro just broke down. And I don't even remember half of what I was saying. I, I think she does, but I don't remember a lot of what I was saying. Yeah. But I ended up telling her about the essay. And I wasn't calling it that at the time. I just told her about this, this thing that, that took place. And, right. And I think I was telling her because I wanted a confirmation that it was both weird and wrong. Right. I, I needed right. that because I, it was very confusing because you're thinking to yourself, this person has seen every part of your body. Right. You've been with them. Like you, so it's like, how do you rationalize what? Right. Calling it. Right. Right. Something else. Right. But she did give me that confirmation, but I still did not involve the police. No. My plan was, okay, I just need to get him out the house. Yeah. And I reached out to, you know, his sister. I reached out to a, a friend of the family at the time and I didn't tell either one of them what had happened. I just said, 
things are not good and I really need them out. That was the wrong decision. And I would tell any woman today that that was the wrong decision. Wait, you reached out to who? I'm sorry. I reached out right. to um, his sister, not telling oh. her what happened. And I reached out to a friend of the family um, that we knew from church, uh, not telling okay. her what happened either. My only thing was things are not good. We need some time apart. I need him to leave. That's That was my only ask. Thinking I could kind of handle it that way. Right, right. Very wrong. Yeah. Certainly turned. And um, mm. ultimately, he remained in the house for a couple weeks after those two assaults. And you left at that moment. I don't even know how to summarize what happened. But I was sitting down in my office a couple weeks after the, those instances. And my, the, my spirit said, check the joint bank account. I stopped working. I checked the joint bank account to find out that the, he had taken uh -huh. a bunch of money out of the account. And at that point, I'm mm -hmm. like, what is going on here? I snapped. I start like, and this is again, I called mm -hmm. his sister. I called the friend from a church. I'm like, I need him gone. I need him out. Like, this was just, all of this was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, long story short, as yeah. short as possible, one of the friends had come, the friend that I had called had come over. The plan was for him, for her to help usher him out. Just right. give us a moment, some, some space. Right. That did not go well. He and I ended up in, a, in an argument, which should have never really escalated to the point that it did. It had that friend had played the role that she was supposed to have played. Right, right. Unfortunately, I, I just was not, I was not handling the situation well. He would not. Yeah. Leave, and I ended up hitting him. Oh. And what this man did was laugh because he knew he got me. Oh, no. And so he showed me his phone and he said, I, I can show this to the police. I was recording you. Now, I don't know if he managed to record everything. But what I do know is he ultimately went upstairs and he called the police. <gasps> and so when I was sitting down in the family room thinking about the fact that he's upstairs packing to leave and I hear the doorbell. I go into the doorbell and it's about three, three police cars outside waiting for me. No. Absolutely. And so I, th I don't remember a whole lot because my head was all over the place. But I remember saying to the police officer, I'm not going to say much to you until I understand what my husband has said. Because I know what had happened <laughs> to me. Right? So yeah. I, I, the police officer didn't really pay too much attention to that. He just said, did you hit, hit him? And I said, yes, I, I did. And he said, well, we have to place you under arrest. Oh, no. Done. Done. Right there. And that day was the last day my children and I ever saw that house. Because I was not allowed to return back to that home because he wouldn't leave. And we couldn't, I had a conditions where I couldn't be within a certain proximity of him. And oh, he would not leave that home. Oh no. So yes. So my children, I, that one mess up, allowing myself to get to that place of emotion cost me and my sons. Oh no. So I was arrested, placed in a police car, brought to a holding cell. And when I was in that holding cell, my brain was just like, I, I was very calm, interestingly enough. I was gonna say, wow. I was very calm, but I was talking to God and I said, did I, what is what did I do? And I, I was trying to understand how is this even possible that I'm here? And I was mm. having a whole conversation with him that I, mm. I don't entirely remember all of it, but I remember asking him, did I, what have I done? Because mm. you know everything that has happened. Why am I here? Mm, mm, it, mm. it was crazy to me. I felt like I was watching myself. In a movie or something. It didn't feel real, but it was real. Mm. And oddly enough, when I called a friend to come and pick me up because I could not return home, she thought I was joking. <laughs> and I said, girl, I'm not joking. And she came, she got me. And from there, it was just a whole other extension of the nightmare. But, and this is why I say to people, if you can settle yourself quickly, please settle yourself. Because the devil is a liar and he will set yeah. you up. And yeah. it was very yeah. obvious that at that time, all the emotions were very heightened. Yeah. And 
Mm-hmm. I allowed myself to succumb to my anger and everything that, that I was feeling in that moment and hit that man. Yeah. For him to never think, I would have never have thought in a million years though that he would ever have invited the police into our home in that way. And I'm thinking to myself, well, he knows what he did, but I, he, yeah, he I had think, you. I, it was so unreal to me. Uh-huh. And so what I've learned, so one, settle yourself. Please don't fall into that trap. And if someone brings any harm to you, I, I'm sorry. If it's your husband, your boyfriend, whoever it is, I'm sorry to say it. Yeah. But you have to, for your own protection, involve the police. Because it is funny how the tables can quickly turn on you. Okay? Wow. And I will also say, as it relates to SA, and here's another thing. Mm. It might be your first time experiencing that, and it might be that person's first time doing it, or it might not be. Because what I later found out, um, and this mm. is why talking is so important, after I kind of overcame the embarrassment of the entire situation, the arrest and whatnot, I slowly started reconnecting with my friends because I disconnected a little bit because I did not want to have to explain what happened, everything that happened, why I wasn't in my home and all of this mess. Right. I ended up talking to a very close friend of mine, have known her for over for about 25 years. And when I told her what happened, even disclosing the, the very embarrassing assault, she just said to me, she goes, I believe you. And she said, and if you need anything from me in terms of being a witness for you, let me know. Mm. Because I ultimately ended up reporting it. And I was thinking to myself at the time, I took it light because I'm like, well, she's my friend. She's known me forever. Of course she would. What else did she do? Only to come to find out some months after that, I had a really rough call with the Crown Attorney because when you decide to report this and when it goes to trial, Mm. Unfortunately, the, the, depending on the Crown Attorney you have, they kind of try to discourage you and scare you about the process. I had a rough day with the Crown Attorney that, I, that was assigned to me at that time. God removed him. And I happened, at, my spirit said, call your friend, this particular friend. Yeah. And so I called her and I was talking to her about the call and whatever. And I happened to say something about, I mentioned the word victim, which I don't love that word, but I happened yeah. to mention it because it was said by the Crown Attorney. And when I said the word victim, she kind of laughed and it irritated me. I, I said to her, why right. are you laughing? I said, right. I'm like, I don't even know why I called you. And I was about to take up a real major attitude. I'm like, I don't even know why I called you. Actually. <laughs> and I was getting ready to get off the phone. And she said to me, just, just give me a second. She's like, I'm not laughing. She's like, just give me a second to tell you something. And when I tell it to you, just let me tell it to you and then speak. So I said, all right. <laughs> So she said, she starts speaking to me about the person in which I was married to. Yeah. And I'm thinking to my head, in my head, she's going to tell me that maybe she saw him somewhere with another woman or something. Right. Which I would not have cared. Right. Right. And but instead, right. she shared with me that a year prior, which would have been six months prior to my incident, he did something extremely inappropriate to her while she was at my home. Oh, no. And mm-hmm. I promise you, Lynn, I could say it, and it's, I, I feel a little bit ashamed mm-hmm. to say it. Had she had told me this before it happened to me, I promise you, I probably would not have believed her. Oh, because that's interesting. That man was a lot of things, but these are things I never expected of him. But when she told me at that time, it did a, two things. One, mm-hmm. it, it, it let me know that what I had what I experienced was not in my imagination by any means. Yeah. And it also let me know that these things aren't always an isolated and probably often are not an isolated incident. They can happen more than once, especially if they're not held accountable. And this legal system really doesn't help hold them accountable. Mm. So, but when she told me that I, I, she would have to describe the cry. I just remember screaming because I was so embarrassed. I was so disgusted. I was a lot, I was in disbelief. Yeah. Like this, this whole thing just kept getting going from yeah. so bad to worse. But it was also revealing to me that God was taking me away. Get, get out of this place, girl. You, you're done. Yeah. 
He said you're done. Wow. Oh, that's man. I I can I couldn't even imagine your resiliency is just beyond inspiring. And and I, I appreciate you for sharing this story because I do believe that a lot of women can really benefit from this. I mean, you said some very powerful thing, very, very powerful, very powerful points that I don't think a lot of us would consider is to one, protect you, you got to protect yourself, even if that puts the other person in that difficult situation. And I think that's what you were talking about earlier, as far as we want to fix everything. We want to keep everything nice and neat and, and mm -hmm. cover people when they're not even covering us. Mm -hmm. We extend grace a little bit too far sometimes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow, Drea, that, that is, in, you know, I, I was just speaking with another guest and she just was she studied the scientific neurology behind domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And she was really given some key points and pointing out even some behaviors to, to look at. And one, I think, like you said earlier today, it's more important when we notice that, okay, enough is enough, you know, whether it's one time or many times, but that point when you know that, okay, I got to make a change. Mm -hmm. And hearing from you, even brings it back even more to like a spiritual point in knowing to listen to God when he's like giving us that gut feeling. Mm -hmm. So I think this is really good. You gave us so many good key points to just kind of take with us and even in our own lives and our own situations and, you know, just stop, stand still and take a look around us. Amen. Ooh, okay. <laughs> So I want you to leave, I want you, before we before we wrap up and before I, I, I close out, I want you to give some ladies some advice. Mm. And I know I just did a recap, but I want you to give us some advice who to women who could possibly be listening to this conversation right now and they are dealing with traumatic experiences in their own marriages right now. What advice would you give them? I even to this moment have a heart for marriage. I love love. I love marriage. But and I know marriage is supposed to be work, but it is not supposed to be a constant toiling. It's not supposed mm -hmm. to be like treacherous, hard work. Yeah. And if that is what it is, if you and your partner are both willing to do the work to recreate your marriage yeah. and bring it closer to what God would have your marriage look like, then I think it's worth fighting for but one person can't fight by themselves. Mm. And I know that we get married, not with the intention of getting divorced. And I think we also look at the biblical aspects about God, you know, not li liking divorce, you know, hating divorce. However, yeah, I think he loves us a lot more and loves our life and our willingness to take that experience, experience the brokenness and see what he will do for us if we just trust our entire being, trust that entire relationship or even the departure of it and place it in his hands and watch what he'll do. Mm. But I don't think any relationship, marriage is worth dying for, mm. whether it be a spiritual death, mm. a physical death, mm. a death. If that relationship is not bringing life, I don't know. <laughs> mm, for me and i love marriage and i still have a heart for it yeah but people need to be willing to do the work and sometimes even when you do the work perhaps that's just not where you're supposed to be i don't mm. know i don't have all the answers because i too have to look at my own yeah. former marriage and, and i'm still dissecting it to this day and still trying to understand you know parts of it yeah, but I, I hear so much and I hear your love. I hear your love. I hear your love. And and that's even, you know, for listeners listening, that makes me, you know, number one, you, you gave us advice from experience. And I love that you have not given up on love. Mm -mm. <laughs> and I love that you know that, you know, although we don't see the plans that God has for us, he does. And he will remove you from a situation because he's already has his hands on you. Exactly. <laughs> so don't be 
crying and trying to stay there. Don't be trying to get back in. into something that he didn't remove you from. Mm -hmm. He's saving you. Okay. That's good. Okay. Drea, tell us where we can find your books and your journal. So, oh, you are fancy. She's right here with my Bible because I was making notes before <laughs> I, got, I came on here. But um, so within Canada, it's on my website, which is okay www.ghpmlives.com. Okay. Um, and then outside of Canada, it's on amazon.com. And yeah, I think that's... Okay. That's All right. And don't worry. I will definitely... You'll send... She will send us information and we will um, put it in the description. And just tell us real quick about what the journals... Does the journal include like ways to kind of, I know you are, you have, it says undressing. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about what, what the journal is about. How can it help us in what area of our lives can it help us? It's very simple for me. Okay. What I believe in journaling. So what it is, is actually a whole lot of journal space, but it also shares my testimony, yeah. parts of it, you know, up until I went to trial basically. <laughs> but it, it, uh, <laughs> It's really talking about the addressing of the many garments that I personally have worn. Mm. Anger, mm. guilt, anxiety. Yeah. I think it was doubt. Like yeah. there's many things that I clothed myself with, whether be whether because my parents kind of initially dropped some of those garments on me and I continued to wear them throughout my life. But just it's talking about the various garments and then the shedding of those garments. Yeah, I, I yeah. love that. I love okay. that. It's really just to encourage people to journal themselves. Like hopefully once they kind of step through those different garments, they can say, well, you know what? I have a few of my own and yeah. just write it out. And how, what are the things that you love about your life? What are the things that you want to change about your life? What garments are you wearing now that you want to get rid of? And what garments do you want to put on instead? I just, I, I like writing. I like journaling. I, I do too. It's healing. It's therapeutic. And it's important to undress Get rid of all of these garments because you got to look at yourself. And once you do, I guess, as you have been saying the whole time, you will find yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and be set free. Okay, Dre, give us some advice that we could take out, take with us throughout the week. What advice would you give us? My advice would be every morning that you've been blessed with life, you could open up your eyes and start another day. It's another opportunity for you to get closer to whatever life you want to have mm. for yourself. Mm. And it's never too late. I don't even care if you're 80 years old. Mm. If you wake up and there's something that you want for yourself, something different, there's no time like the present. But don't keep thinking that you have tomorrow because we don't know if we have tomorrow. Mm. But do it now. <laughs> mm. Drea, those words, those words of wisdom. I want to thank you so much for coming and pouring at this well today. I thank you so much for being vulnerable. Thank you so much for telling your story. And thank you for giving us some insight that we can take with us throughout the week. I want to thank you so much for being my special guest here at the well. I want to thank all you ladies for listening and tuning in. And we will definitely leave the information for Drea. Please follow her on all social media. And if you were blessed by this episode and you know someone who would be blessed by it, we ask that you forward it over to them, send it over to them. We ask that you like and you subscribe. So thank you for tuning in. Perhaps, just maybe perhaps, you were chosen for such a time as this to write, to tell your story, your truth. Until next time. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.